Now we're ready to look at cell mediated immune response. This is the other branch of the adaptive immune system. So now we'll look at T cells. And just like we looked at B cell activation, we have to see how T cells are activated and the role that antigen presenting cells have in that activation. Then we'll also look at two types of T cells primarily, and those are the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells. Now in cell mediated immunity, there are basically two populations of T cells based on these glycoproteins that are found on the cell membrane of the um, cells, that, of these T cells. And these are they're going to be CD4 cells or CD8 cells. CD4 cells, when they're activated, become helper T cells, regulatory T cells, or memory T cells. CD8 cells, when they're activated, become cytotoxic T cells. So we can look and see what the major categories or types of T cells and how we differentiate these T cells that I mentioned. Um, first of all, there's the cytotoxic T cells. As I said, they came from CD8 cells. So when CD8 cells become activated, they become could become cytotoxic T cells. And cytotoxic T cells are in charge of directly attacking antigens and physically and chemically altering them so they don't do us any harm. So you can think of these as the infantry in our war on pathogens. The helper T cell is formed from the CD4 cells and when it's activated, it will um, stimulate both B cells and T cells. And so it kind of runs the show. Um, so in a sense, it's the general of our army and it's absolutely essential because this is the only way we can get cytotoxic T cells and B cells activated. Then there's memory T cells. These come from either CD4 or CD8 cells. They remain in reserve for possible second infection. And so if we get infected by the same pathogen again, these guys can mount a very quick response and differentiate either into cytotoxic T cells or helper T cells and get rid of that pathogen very quickly. Then there's regulatory or suppressor T cells. These come from CD4 cells as well. They inhibit T cells and B cells so that way they can moderate the immune response and kind of keep it in check. So think of these guys as the um, military police for our army. Now one of the things we have to look and see what the world do we care about <laughs> this CD8 versus CD4 and how that ties in with the type of, of antigen they're going to fight. So let's think, first look at endogenous anti antigens versus exogenous antigens. Now an endogenous antigen is an antigen that came from within the cell, that its origin started within the cell. So think of viral proteins, for example, like in this picture, a virus infected this cell and got the cell to start making viral proteins. And these viral proteins, since they were made in the cell, would be considered endogenous. Or a cancer cell that was starting to go crazy would start making weird proteins. In either case, um, they put their, their pro these proteins on the MHC class 1. And we talked about this before. This is kind of our red flag um, to indicate that there's something wrong with what's going on inside the cell. So here this cell is presenting what's going on on its MHC class 1. So that's the endogenous source of an antigen. Now the only thing that can bind to an MHC class 1 is a T cell receptor from a CD8 cell. So this T cell receptor fits against or binds with this MHC class 1, but it only will do so if its binding site matches the peptide antigen that's thrown out there by this body cell on its MHC class 1. So in other words, it has to have the right binding site to fit this protein. If it does, it'll bind. If it doesn't have the right shape for that protein, it's just going to ignore the whole thing. But there's some population, there's some group of Navy SEALs out there who will recognize and bind to that particular peptide and therefore be activated or lead to the activation of that group of cytotoxic T cells. So that's the so here again we have the T cell receptor having a binding site that fits this particular antigen and that antigen is being presented on the MHC class 1. 
This happens, this arrangement happens in CD8 cells. So I want you to remember class 1, MHC class 1's with CD8. And so again, we're looking to see what's going on inside the cell and letting the cytotoxic T cell know what's going on. Now exogenous antigens, instead they have antigens from outside the cell. So this is an antigen presenting cell. Remember, he's our scout. He went out looking for pathogens. He found this antigen and engulfed it, processed it, and stuck it on his MHC class 2. Now, the CD4 cell has a T cell receptor that can only bind to MHC class 2s. And again, just like before, this binding site in that T cell receptor has to be of the right shape to be able to bind with this particular antigen. If it's a different shape, it would ignore it. So we have to find the right population of CD4 cells that can bind to that, pop, that um, antigen or that peptide here. So again, you've got MHC class 2 presenting the antigen to the gen what's going to be the general, our CD4 cell, and then fitting that T cell receptor. So again, our scout's saying what's going on to that CD4 cell. So again, I want you to think now of the MHC class 2s only being related to CD4 cell activation. So kind of a way to remember that keep CD8 with class 1 and CD4 with class 2 is think of this formula. If I take 8, CD8 times MHC1, 8 times 1 equals 8. And CD4s with MHC2s, 2 times 4 also equals 8. So the only way I can make this combination equal to each other, if I took CD8s and combined them with MHC class 2s, 8 times 2 is 16, and I took 1 times 4, that would be 4, 16 doesn't equal 4. So I've got to keep it so that they both equal 8. And I can remember CD8s with 1, and CD4 is with two, and I don't have to think that through anymore. I've got a way to remember them. So now let's look at T cell activation and differentiation then, this idea of how things are combining together. Well, the activation is actually a two-step process. We need that T cell receptor and the CD4 or CD8 binding to the MHC class two or one. So in other words, this the T cell receptor of a CD4 binds with MHC class 2s. The T cell receptor of a CD8 binds with MHC class 1. That's what we saw on the slide before. But that's not enough. We need a co-stimulation as well. So we might get this binding here. You can see here that this inactive T cell is being presented with an antigen by an antigen presenting cell. And you've got the MHC class 2, CD4, here's your T cell receptor binding. They're all binding to that antigen and present it to it. That is that plus some co-stimulation signal from the antigen presenting cell will get this inactive helper T cell to now become activated. So now he's activated, then he can undergo proliferation and, and multiply. Mm -hmm. Once he's multiplied, then he's going to make all kinds of clones, and those clones are either going to be memory T cells or helper T cells, and those helper T cells are generals that are going to activate cytotoxic T cells or B cells and will get rid of the pathogen. Now, the resulting clones for this undergo apoptosis, remember cell death, uh, between 7 and 30 days after activation. They don't, so they don't last for a long time. But that's okay, because if they acted, or if they, they stayed active too long, they end up being a hazard because they also, T helper cells, secrete pro-inflammatory chemicals, and we don't want too much inflammation, especially once the tissue's healed, we don't need any more inflammatory response. Also, once the antigen's removed, they really aren't needed anymore, so they can go away. Now, the memory T cells last a long time because they're going to hang out to remember uh, what happened and then be able to mount a quick immune response if we're infected again. So once a T cell is activated, it 
becomes functional. And so let's look and see what the helper T cell does and, or what its functions are. And we've already seen this one. Basically, the helper T cell down here is going to bind to a B cell that's become sensitized. So remember, he's kind of the Steve Rogers. Okay, he's been sensitized because he's presented the antigen it, it engulfed on its MHC class 2. And remember, this is CD4 cell, so it binds to, so the helper T cell can bind to that MHC class 2. And therefore, the helper T cell, along with secreting some cytokines, will do the double stimulation of that helper T excuse me, of that B cell and turn the B cell from Steve Rogers into Captain America. And now he's ready to go and fight the infection or start making all kinds of antibodies. Another thing that helper T cells can do is activate or help in activating cytotoxic T cells. Now here we can see a helper T cell bound to a dendritic cell. So again, this is our antigen presenting cell. He's put his, the antigen on its MHC class 2. So this is CD4 again. So he's going to CD4 with MHC class 2. So the helper T cell is now sensitized or act, actually activated um, by this dendritic cell. Now the helper T cell then in turn is going to help in getting the cytotoxic T cell down here activated. Right now in this picture, the notice that the dendritic cell has also stuck that antigen on its MHC class 1. Now 1 MHC class 1s can bind to CD8 cells. Here's the CD8. And the cytotoxic T cell is a CD8 cell. So it binds there and that sensitizes this cytotoxic T cell. So again, it turns them to Steve Rogers. He wants to go. He's kind of willing to go, but he just doesn't have the oomph to do anything. And then what the helper T cell, now that he's activated, will get or express um, co-stimulatory molecules on its surface and get the dendritic cell to co-stimulate the cytotoxic T cell and turn that cytotoxic T cell into an active T cell or basically uh, Captain America. And now this cytotoxic T cell will go out and start doing some killing. So how does the cytotoxic T cell go out and kill? Well, it's in charge of immune surveillance as well. Um, in this case, like the um, natural killer cell, the cytotoxic T cell will circulate in and out of the blood in search of body cells that have red flags on them. So again, here's our MHC class 1 body cell. Now let's say this cell has a virus infect, infection. So he stuck a viral component outside of the MHC1 here, and that's our red flag saying, hey, I'm sick with a virus, you got to kill me. So here it's binding on its um, T cell receptor with a CD8, and that triggers the release of perforins and granzymes. Just like the natural killer cell, those perforins punch holes, the granzymes go in and cause apoptosis, and we've got one dead um, body cell from that. So in summary then, let's look at all the components of this cell immune defense. So first of all, let's imagine we've got here a virus. Now the a macrophage finds this um, this virus and engulfs it and presents it on its MHC class 2s. So here's the antigen here from the virus, the MHC class 2. He, remember, he's our scout. He goes up to the general, the helper T cell here, and says, hey, look what I found. So the helper T cell binds with its T cell receptor that fits that particular antigen. So he's got to go, in other words, the macrophage has to go to the right general that can fit with that antigen. And that stimulates or activates the helper T cell. So now the helper T cell is like, oh gosh, I got to do something about this. Okay. Meanwhile, a dendritic cell processes an antigen and it processes the antigen of that virus and puts it on its MHC class 1. Now a CD8 cell or cytotoxic T cell can bind to that MHC class 1 and he now becomes 
sensitized. So he's our Steve Rogers, willing and able, but doesn't have the strength to do anything. So now the helper T cell, now that he's activated, he can convert this Steve Rogers sensitized cytotoxic T cell and cause it to proliferate and become Captain America cells. And these are Captain America cells are going to multiply and either become memory cells or become active cytotoxic T cells and find body cells that are infected with that virus and kill them. And that way we get rid of these viral infected cells. Okay? Or, and we could do the same scenario saying if it was a cancer cell as well. So that's our T cell immunity. And the last thing we're going to look at is how then these B cells and T cells give us, uh, in some cases, a lifelong immunity to particular pathogens.